There is something special about being the very first game in a franchise. It's a fresh page, a blank canvas, something that can only be done once, so no other game will ever provide that same feeling to its players. There can't be any expectations going into it, and you don't risk losing any fans because, quite frankly, you do not have any. After the Kingdom Hearts critique video, I was honestly blown away with the amount of people that just checked it out and shared very similar opinions. The sense of simple enjoyment and immersion, not over the top but still enjoyable combat, accompanied by nostalgia for both the game and Disney are just some of the main reasons why people love going back to the original game. So as soon as I wrapped up that video, I could not wait to jump straight into the next game in the franchise, Kingdom Hearts 3 Chain of Memories. And there are a few reasons why. Of course, first of all, I was excited to continue this series of revisiting one of my favourite franchises of all time. However, what made me extra excited for this game specifically is just the amount of heavily mixed opinions regarding it online. Unlike Kingdom Hearts 1, Chain of Memories is not an easy game to get into. You can't just introduce this to your friend, family member or loved ones and say, oh, try this out, you will absolutely love it. And that's because Chain of Memories, for better or worse, is very unique. This is mostly due to its combat system which heavily differs from the first game, no longer being simple and easy to understand. It now requires much more focus and attention to detail if you have any hopes of reaching the end. It's so different in fact that many people who are trying to get into the franchise would rather watch a cutscene compilation online than actually attempt to beat the game. Of course that's better than just skipping the game fully but it still hurts to see this because the experience you get from just the cutscenes will quite frankly never be the same as actually playing through the game. I have the exact same opinion about 358 over 2 days as well, which on current consoles is only available through cutscenes. As for the other reason why I was looking forward to this video, like I mentioned earlier, it is no longer a blank canvas. Despite it not being called Kingdom Hearts 2, Chain of Memories is very much a sequel in every aspect of imagination. Specifically, it is made to be played after the original game, and it's crucial to get the best experience out of Kingdom Hearts 2. So as it is no longer the starting point, there are now actual expectations and guidelines people would expect the game to follow, meaning the chance of disappointment is now possible. This video will contain spoilers heavily in the second half when I deep dive into both Sora and Riku's journeys respectively, so if you are yet to play this game or you are currently playing it then I highly advise you come back after beating the game just to make sure you have the best experience yourself. I mean if you want you can still totally leave a like or comment saying uh, you'll come back when you're done or whatever. It does really help. Despite Chain of Memories being nowhere near as popular or loved as the original game, or Kingdom Hearts 2 of course, I still wanted to give it the attention it deserves. So if this video is a bit too long for your liking, I will have timestamps for different sections of the video. A quick disclaimer before we begin, I will be focusing solely on the re version of the game, not the original GBA one. I understand some consider that to be the definitive version, however, I wanted to cover the one that most people are likely to play nowadays, as well as still attempting and showcasing the difficulty of reaching 100% trophies in the these games which let's just uh, let's just say you need a lot of time if you enjoyed this video a like or comment would be very much appreciated these videos do take a lot of time to make and your interactions help reach a wider audience which heavily supports what i do here i still can't thank you guys enough for the amount of support you showed on the original kingdom hearts critique so if we can get even anything close to that i would honestly be blown away and uh it does really mean a lot but without any further ado let's get into it and discuss kingdom hearts rechain of memories a very crucial yet overlooked game Chain of Memories picks up exactly where the first game left off. Sora, Donald and Goofy succeed in defeating Ansem and manage to close the door to Kingdom Hearts with the help of King Mickey and Riku on the other side. This leaves them once again separated from the people they spend the original game looking for as Riku is with King Mickey and Kairi returns to Destiny Islands. The very last moment of Kingdom Hearts we see our trio walking down a path coming across Pluto with a letter from King Mickey. We never actually find out what this letter says but knowing Kingdom Hearts this might come back in like 10 years. This path ends up leading them to Castle Oblivion, the focal point of Chain of Memories. Applying the same mindset as in the previous game, our trio decides to explore the mysterious castle under the assumption that King Mickey and Riku might be inside. They are met by a man in a black cloak who lets them know as soon as they enter they forgot all the magic spells and abilities they ever knew. This is basically the way the game is going to tell you, hey, by the way, you're back to level 1, so you don't actually know any skills. He hands Sora a card based on his memories which will allow him to open the door ahead and provides one more bit of information to lose and claim a new or or to claim a new only to lose. Soon after heading through the door, Sora finds himself in what looks to be Travis Town, except this is a Travis Town based on his own memories. This is followed by a super quick combat tutorial which instantly comes off a very different from what we learned in the first game, but I'm gonna save all of that gameplay talk for later. Throughout Travis Town, Sora realizes that all he sees and everyone he meets are based on his actual experience in the first game. So the other characters, heartless types, and even eventually the final enemy will be the exact same as what he experienced originally. As Sora is about 
to leave Travis Town, Aerith warns him to be cautious of his own memories as they might deceive him, and he shouldn't let these emotions distract him from what truly matters. This moment right here essentially foreshadows the entire plot of Chain of Memories, which is something the game will do a lot. There will be multiple occasions where the game will hint or foreshadow future events, most of which occur throughout Kingdom Hearts 2. What is nice about these moments, however, is that they don't come off necessarily as obvious to someone playing the game for the first time. After getting out of Travis Town, we get introduced to a new character in Axel, who is another member of what we learned to be Organization 13. These characters will be constantly popping in and out throughout the story and are showcased to be the clear conductors of the events taking place. After a little bit of a fight and a conversation, Axel tells Sora to follow his memories and it will lead him to finding someone very special. As he leaves, Axel leaves us with more cards to further explore Castle Oblivion. Sora has to open a door using one of these cards which represent his memories. This means every floor is a different world we already experienced in the first game. And this is really where my first main issue of the game comes in, I would say this part of the plot actually hurts Chain of Memories. The player will always know what to expect to an extent, you can imagine which enemies you'll be facing, and there really isn't much suspense regarding what the final fight will be in each world if you just remember what it was the first time around. And if you're like me and you're playing this straight after Kingdom Hearts 1, you are very much aware of what you just did. As the trio continues heading through the castle, they realise they begin to lose certain memories. As they get further into the castle and complete more worlds, the more memories they seem to have lost. However, they keep pursuing and pressing on as it is still possible Riku and King Mickey are this someone very special they are somewhere in this castle. For our main three characters, this is a risk worth taking. In just the first couple of hours, we get introduced to a brand new organization who are clearly the main antagonist, a new location that's extremely mysterious to us, our reasoning for why we keep pushing forward, and of course the brand new, nowadays infamous, card-focused gameplay system. I will be diving into much more detail regarding this story later on in this video for both Sora and Riku of course, but I like to get gameplay covered first. In the case of Chain of Memories, I feel like it's especially crucial to dive deep into everything it offers and how it changes the feel of the original game for both better or worse depending on the area. The gameplay section will be long so I do want to split it into sections, that being combat, exploration and Riku. So make sure to use the timestamps if you're looking for something very specific. As mentioned before, Chain of Memories combat is very much different from the original game. It is no longer action combat with a base attack, magic, summons, dodging and blocking, all of which really came together and became smoother the further into the original game you were. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, instead of that, we get cards. I always consider Chain of Memories to be my guilty pleasure when it comes to Kingdom Hearts anyways. I have always found genuine enjoyment playing Chain of Memories, or at least from a memory, that's how it felt. Yeah, the first time I played it, I hated it, and a lot of that could be because I was really young and didn't understand why my attacks didn't do anything, but as I got older, I started enjoying it for just how different it is from any game I've ever played. So with that said and out of the way, now let's break it down. In Chain of Memories, everything revolves around cards, and that's for both combat as well as general progression throughout the game. During combat, you will use a variety of cards like attack cards, which are varieties of keyblades from different worlds, magic cards, such as fire, blizzard, cure, item cards, which can reload either attack or magic cards, and lastly, friend cards, which will appear randomly on the battlefield and depend on whichever world you're in. A lot of people that try playing Chain of Memories will say this is a confusing and hectic system, but in reality, it can be broken down very easily. The main concept is that each card has a number, these numbers go in from 0 all the way up to 9. You're going to execute your attacks using a attack, magic or friend card. If your opponent then uses a card at the same time, then the card with a higher number wins and that command will be executed. This is what we call card breaking. This rule will always work except for one occasion, the number 0 card. These cards are able to break any enemy cards regardless of how high the number, however they can also be broken by anything higher than 0. Therefore they should always be used by waiting for whenever your enemy has chosen an attack. When used correctly they will be the greatest strength and save you during the most desperate times, however, when activated at the wrong time, it can turn the tables against you. During combat, all the cards in the game can be stacked up. You can stack three cards together, which adds up their total number, making them harder to break. This is also the method used to power up magic spells, as well as activate special abilities known as slights, when the correct cards are stacked up. For example, if you were to use three thunder cards, that would cast Fandaga. And if you were to use three attack cards of different types, meaning three different keyblades, and they add up to anywhere between 20 and 23 in total, you would end up using Sonic Blade, which is one of the many slights available in the game. You unlock these slights throughout multiple 
multiple methods such as leveling up or finding them in treasure chests, they're essentially your offensive skills from Kingdom Hearts 1. You find that as you face more challenging fights, these will become more crucial in your playstyle, especially against bosses as they usually have better cards available and use them with a bit more intelligence making them harder to break. I will discuss slights more in just a moment because they heavily affect the late game especially. Whenever you stack up free cards, there is a penalty to pay. Whichever card was chosen first is now gone for the remainder of the fight, unless you have a specific item card to bring it back, making it crucial to not accidentally use up your higher numbered cards or use zero cards when you're being rushed. As long as you don't use that card first, you can keep it. However, if you keep spamming slights or stronger magic spells or even just stack up free cards, you will eventually have less and less cards available if the fight takes longer than expected. When playing as Sora, all the cards you have available will depend on your deck. You will have to make adjustments to decide what cards you will take with you into combat. As Sora levels up, you can either increase HP, increase CP, or learn a new slight whenever that is available. Sora's CP is basically a limitation on what cards he can equip. Each card has an assigned number of CP points depending on factors such as what type of card it is and how powerful it is as well. The amount of cards in a deck doesn't really matter as long as the total number of CP is lower than Sora's max. This could mean a deck with only 10 cards which all require a lot of CP or you can have 20 cards but they will all be lower ranked and probably wouldn't do much damage on their own. Deck management is really key here for a smooth playthrough, planning ahead, especially with boss fights you must know exactly what sort of movesets you have available and if they work against the enemy you're facing. And this is where one of the most crucial parts of Chain of Memories comes into play. Increasing your max CP is by far the most crucial factor in the game. It will allow you to use better cards as well as equip more meaning more opportunities for slights or stronger magic to be used. Having high HP is nowhere near as crucial in this game as it was in Kingdom Hearts 1. What good will it do you lasting a few more hits when with low CP you won't have enough to defend yourself let alone counter attack the enemies. As you go through multiple worlds you get more cards such as keyblades, spells, summons which eventually can all be used to create some sort of slides. Meaning that similar to Kingdom Hearts 1, what starts off as mostly basic attacks, later on becomes over the top crazy movesets that destroy enemies at a much faster pace. However, the reason I would say Chain of Memories early combat is actually better than the original game is the challenge. You can't just spam attack hoping to win because your early deck will be very limited, therefore it can easily be broken, especially on the higher difficulties. You have to play smart, you need good timing of when to use what cards, and you can't afford to waste any high numbered attack. Chain of Memories forces you to essentially get good. You can't just spam your way through the game by just pressing X. For someone who likes challenge, I found this really refreshing after Kingdom Hearts 1. Unfortunately, this feeling doesn't remain forever. The issue with the card system is that eventually it's easily taken advantage of. Once you've played through the first 4-5 to five worlds, you unlock enough slice which you can basically spam to get most wins. All it takes is for your deck to be built in a very specific way. The main one that is widely considered to be essentially a cheat code is Sonic Blade. It is basically a god tier skill that should not be unlocked as early as it is. Not only does it lock up the enemy making it impossible for them to get out, it has multiple follow up attacks allowing for high amounts of damage. In the case of multiple enemies you can take out 2 or 3 Heartless depending on which enemies they are of course, but where it is clearly overpowered is during pretty much any single boss fight. You can win your way through honestly about 80% of fights by just spamming Sonic Blade and once this is something you realise it's honestly hard not to use it. Of course you can just tell yourself not to do it but that's not what should be expected of a player. We shouldn't have to force restrictions on ourselves just to make the game more fair. As you continue leveling up through the game, completing different worlds and finding chests, you unlock more and more of these attacks that are just far too powerful and can make what was initially a nicely challenging game into a spam triangle to win. This is not the last time Kingdom Hearts will do this but um... More on that in Kingdom Hearts 2. All of this not to say you can't find challenge in this game because you absolutely can. Even with all of this, I would still easily consider Chain of Memories to be the harder game so far anyways in the franchise. There are some boss fights such as Vexion that can and most likely will beat your ass the first time you do them. I just wish I could say that regarding the entire game but its own mechanics make it much easier than I believe it was ever intended to be. It's a shame and it genuinely saddens me that a game which forces you to get good and understand its combat at the beginning then throws all of that away and you just do whatever you want. It makes the combat lose the initial selling point of having to be smart of your moves and instead it starts feeling bland as you approach every single encounter with the same strategy in mind. Once you have your favourite slice you can set it up so that first two attacks at those slice exactly and after that you're done. 
I feel like a big chunk of players that attempt Chain of Memories do not even get past the first two worlds. They just do not enjoy the gameplay. But yet, it feels like the late game combat is what they would have enjoyed much more and probably would have kept playing if only they knew what it eventually becomes. The only benefit of this easy taken combat in the late game especially is that leveling up or trying to reach level 99 becomes much easier, even though it still requires a lot of hours. Regardless of all that, it is still a combat system I genuinely enjoy, even if the first couple hours are by far my favourite, I can still find some enjoyment in the late game grinding. Now looking past the combat itself, let's discuss the locations you'll be visiting and how all of that works because this is where, once again, a lot of my issues with the game come to shine. As mentioned previously, Sora needs to advance through the castle by opening doors. Each door will be based off his memories, which basically is the game saying, hey, uh, go and revisit every single world you've been to in the first game, except for Deep Jungle. We're not allowed that one anymore. As you enter, each world is made up of multiple rooms. As for what is inside that room depends on the map card you use before entering. These are split into three categories based on colour. Red is enemy, these range from factors like how many heartless you can expect, to how aggressive they are, or even if they will have high or low numbered cards. Green is status, these cards are most beneficial to you during combat for example, there's a higher chance of a friend card spawning, or if you get the first hit all enemies will be stunned or start with low HP. And lastly, blue is bounty, these for the most part have no enemies and are more about the rewards, that being treasures, a moogle shop to buy or sell cards, as well as safe points. Each room will have a requirement you must meet with the map card you choose. You get these cards by battling Heartless, which is a clever way of the game ensuring you take part in at least some battles, rather than just trying to speedrun every single world. You need to make sure you have enough cards for the possible requirements, as especially in the late game, you will find doors which need you to provide a high total number by using multiple cards. There are two cards that are very different from anything else. The first is a random joker card, which will fill out any requirement, regardless of what color or number is required, which I highly recommend saving for the late game. The second is a key to reward card, which opens a very special chest room with a reward of a higher standard than a regular treasure chest would normally have. As you go through the floors of Castle Oblivion, the sheer amount of rooms in each world will begin to increase. The first couple of worlds can be completed in 30-40 to 40 minutes, while some of the late game ones will require more than an hour if you are planning to go through every single room. Unfortunately, what makes these rooms unappealable is that they are all very similar, essentially the same thing, just a different filter. And I do understand this is heavily due to it being a remake of the original GBA game which had its graphical limitations, I understand all of that. But after completing a few floors, you start seeing basically the same layout every single place you go. This even puts a negative effect on the overall gameplay as it becomes extremely tedious doing the same thing over and over again, except more with each world you enter. There is nothing new here, nothing worth exploring, the only major difference being the types of enemies and the quote unquote story you'll witness. And I say story in quotations because I'm not sure we can even call it that. I know I've already mentioned a few issues with the game but this is by far my biggest one. I understand from the gameplay side of things why you need to go for all these Disney worlds. We have to level up, we have to get better at the game, unlock new abilities and so on. But in terms of actual story that makes any sort of difference to Sora as a character, we get zero absolutely nothing. Some of these really do try and have dialogue telling us just how necessary memories are. And yet the entire time I thought to myself, if I skip this right now, I would miss out absolutely nothing. Sora leaves the world only for it to be never spoken about again and he is the same as he was before entering the room. Every single world follows the exact same formula. You need three cards to complete each one. Key to beginning, key to guidance, and the key to truth, which is where you take on the final boss of each world. Once all of that is done, you move on to the final room which has a massive ladder, come out and enjoy the actual story Chain of Memories has to tell. In the end, you will do this for every single floor of Castle Oblivion. Key to beginning, key to guidance, key to truth, boss battle, big ladder, actual story, rinse and repeat. There is no order to any of these, you could switch the first world with the 8th and Sora would act the exact same, but on the outside he's forgotten a ton by this point. When you're more than halfway into the game and the story is really starting to pick up, or even if the previous floor left you on a massive cliffhanger that you want answered, it doesn't actually matter what world you got next on the list because all you care about is getting it done and out of the way so you can see the actual story progress. And just the fact you get excited over seeing a white room with a staircase should tell you a lot about the design of both the exploration and the story in the Disney worlds. 
Before I go any further into story breakdown, I do want to cover Riku's gameplay side of things, as it differs from Sora for both better and worse, depending on how you look at it. Also, I am fully aware I keep using the phrase better or worse, and that's just because Chain of Memories kind of works like that. Some people love these changes, some people hate them. Some of these changes are great, but they bring something negative along as well. Just the idea of playing as Riku is a big step for Kingdom Hearts, as we are actually able to play as someone other than Sora, and who better than the best friend who was built up at the end of Kingdom Hearts 1 as potentially a deep and troubled character. This time, rather than just seeing it through Sora's eyes, we will actually get to see his thought process, what internal struggles he deals with, and everything that might come his way. Riku's gameplay follows the exact same format as the rest of the game, of course, using cards to fight and explore the worlds between floors of the castle. The main difference here being that you no longer have a say in what cards you have available. Instead, your deck is predetermined at the beginning of each world. I understand not everyone might agree with me here, but I actually think this was a great design choice, especially as you can only play this after finishing Sora's story. You just got done using most likely extremely overpowered decks, so the game suddenly forcing you to use what they consider difficult is a nice bit of challenge. The whole point of Riku's gameplay is to break enemy cards. As you successfully do that, you enter dark mode. This is essentially a boosted version of Riku in which you can use some slights unlike the base version. This on top of the fact that Riku can't heal himself unless he uses a King Mickey card is what made this playthrough a bit more fun. I felt that challenge which faded in the first playthrough far too quickly remained here for much longer. When Riku levels up, unlike Sora, his three choices are increasing HP, increasing AP, or increasing Dark Mode. The amount of times you can level up the AP is limited, so it really comes down to choosing between Health and Dark Mode, and this choice heavily depends on your playstyle and just how much you want to rely on using Dark Mode. Unlike Sora's playthrough, I would actually highly recommend leveling up your HP a bit more often with Riku, as his healing methods are far more limited and you need to play a bit more safe. Once again, if you're playing at the more higher difficulties, this is especially crucial. Overall, Riku's combat is not as flashy or Powered as Sora, however, the concept of having a new deck out of your control every single time is what made every single world a little bit more fresh and unique. But of course, all of this is purely combat. The exploration and story of the Disney worlds with Riku is just a whole other issue. At first, you get the idea that these Disney worlds will actually prove useful. We might get to see what Riku is going through during the events of Kingdom Hearts 1. In the very first world you visit, which is Hollow Bastion, we see how he actually had a room. Now, <laughs> Reading this out loud sounds really dumb, but just hear me out. We see how he actually had a room that Maleficent provided him, and how he talks about the lonely experience after cutting everyone off. However, once Hollow Bastion is wrapped up, that's it. We get absolutely no more cutscenes or deep dives into Riku's experiences in these Disney worlds. You simply enter, beat the boss, find the big ladder, and leave. Rinse, and repeat. This feels like easily the biggest wasted potential on Kingdom Hearts so far. There was a possibility here to actually see what Riku did and how he felt at all the moments we saw him in the original game. Travis Town, Monstro, Agrabah, Neverland, all of these locations we know Riku was in during the first game. So showcasing at least a little bit more behind the scenes of emotions and challenges could have developed him even further than Chain of Memories does later on. I know that's not the point of his journey through the castle, I understand, but I just can't ignore how much of a wasted opportunity this was. Now, luckily for us, what happens outside of these Disney worlds in both Sora's and Riku's gameplay heavily makes up for all the extreme basics we have to put up with, because the real story story of Chain of Memories is simply incredible. I want to start this bit with a statement. Not only do I think Chain of Memories has a better main story than the original game in terms of script, depth and delivery, I would go as far as to say this is one of the best stories in the entire franchise. That's not me saying it's definitely the best, but I would most certainly have it in my top 3. As far as the other two, I don't want to say it until we get there, but Kingdom Hearts 1 is not one of them. As mentioned earlier, as the trio of Sora, Donald and Goofy keep heading up the castle, they start to forget more and more memories. This is due to a mysterious girl called Namine, who has the ability to control and alter Sora's memories to the point that a new inserted changes will feel like the truth. Her reasoning for this, however, isn't by choice, but instead because she's forced by the leader of Castle Oblivion and a member of Organization 13, Marluxia, who has a plan to turn Sora into his puppet which will help him overtake the rest of the organization. This results in Sora not only losing memories but gradually seeming to remember some really old ones too. It starts off simple with him remembering there was another girl on the island when they were kids, but as he gets deeper into the castle these memories become more clear and keep progressing to the point where Namine replaces Kairi in Sora's life. All of these changes made by Namine are further supported and backed up by the members of the organization themselves. From Larkseen showing up and pointing out a good luck charm Namine gave Sora as kids, 
it to Vex in creating a Riku replica, which basically makes Sora feel like crap for not protecting Namine, which is very reminiscing of the original game, where Riku did pretty much the exact same thing but regarding Kairi. As the story progresses, we see Sora changing as a person, to the point where he even abandons Donald and Goofy because they question some of these sudden new memories he acquired. After witnessing how much Sora cares about all his friends in the original game, it actually hurts to see him throw all of that away and you the players start looking at him thinking, is this really the Sora that I know? Even though we've only spent one game with him up until this point, he made such an impression on everyone, we just know this isn't what he would really do. This is one of this game's main ideas that it tries to bring across. Is it memories that shape us as people? Is that what makes us who we are and behave in the ways that we do? This is clearly the case with Sora, but also Replica Riku is another example where the game makes you think, even though he is clearly just a replica and was created recently, the memories Namine put inside his head feel real to him. So does that mean he's allowed to feel real? Can this replica consider itself real enough? Outside of all of this, what I appreciate about Chain of Memories story is how it always had me wanting to know what's next. Every main story cutscene, no matter how big or small, would provide more information for me to think about until next time. And this was for multiple reasons, whether that's new character introductions, story reveals, or a great boss fight against someone from Organization 13. It just sucked that in order to get these answers or any sort of information, I would first have to complete a pointless revisit of a Disney world. So whilst the pacing of the story is a huge issue, the actual context of it is great. It works as this amazing setup to make the story of future games more impactful and more rich in this lore. Some of the characters we meet here will be shown in every game moving forward, whilst others don't make an appearance for another few entries and that's kind of the beauty of it, making that reveal even more exciting for the player whenever we see them again. Kingdom Hearts 2 benefits the most from this, which makes sense considering it is the next game to be played. It allows emotional attachments to be built here, only for them to be executed fully in the next game. This prevents any of them being rushed, or the game just trying to cram everything forcefully into one game. Where Kingdom Hearts 1 has an extremely charmful and wholesome story about this young boy and his first adventure, Chain of Memories takes a much deeper dive into a more serious and complex story that didn't need to rely on Disney to keep the player intrigued. Instead, it is built on and supported by an amazing cast of new characters, all original to the universe of Kingdom Hearts. During my Kingdom Hearts review, I mentioned that for a game with so many different characters, we only get a total of four game originals, that being Sora, Riku, Kairi, and Ansem. In Chain of Memories, on the other hand, we get introduced to a total of eight new characters. Of course, not all of them are equally important to the story, but just the fact we doubled the amount of game original characters is a huge benefit for the world and universe of Kingdom Hearts. Not to mention, six of those characters being members of Organization 13, who hugely affect the events of Kingdom Hearts 2, which once again, showcases how Chain of Memories is one of the biggest reasons Kingdom Hearts 2 was able to succeed as much as it did. Out of the six Organization 13 members, Axel is easily the standout, becoming a fan favourite in just a few short scenes, his personality comes across both goofy yet extremely cruel and ruthless when needs to be. Laxine is another character that can bring genuine emotion out of you, whatever that emotion might be, as she comes off much more self-centred and sadistic to an extent, clearly loving the idea of a fight and humiliating anyone who stands in her way. And even if Marluxia isn't the greatest main villain ever, he still manages to come off cunning and unpredictable of what his next movement might be. All of this whilst looking absolutely stunning. These characters brought something new into Kingdom Hearts, a bit more seriousness and maturity which is definitely easier to do when you haven't got Disney characters running around in the back. All of this is largely helped by the much improved voice acting compared to the first game. That's not to say Kingdom Hearts 1 had horrible voice acting all around, but Chain of Memories comes off across as smoother, more believable and just realistic. I would happily say every single main character sounds better than before and if I had to pick one as the best performance overall, it might just have to be Larxene. I mean, just listen to her. Your Riku was supposed to counter Sora. Talk about heartless. I can't believe you. Just do a good job rewriting Sora's heart. Then you can actually be somebody. Her voice acting in this game perfectly describes her personality without actually having to explain it to us. Quickly, I do think it is important to appreciate and take in Riku's story as well and what it has to offer just as much. Whilst understandably not being as crucial as the events that take place for Sora, which again makes absolute sense, he isn't the main character, he is no longer overshadowed by Sora which allows the players to get a better feel for him, his mindset and the inner battles he faces. Whilst admittedly his story isn't as crazy or full of reveals, it still provides some interesting hints for future events, especially with the organization members saying how he has the scent of the superior, which this whole thing about of smelling darkness and just smelling everything. Yeah, um, not the best writing. 
this didn't need to be so in your face. I mean, it's fine once or twice, but half of Riku's dialogue comes down to the words darkness, smell, and show yourself. He loves those three. You reek of darkness. But at the end of the day, for Riku, it's a journey of reflection and self-realization about who he really is and about facing his fears. We see development between him and King Mickey, as well as Ansem, who continues to get development past Kingdom Hearts 1. Again, it might not come off as anything incredible, but I appreciate the build-up for future games and Riku's character proving to be more than just a good friend of the main protagonist. If anything, Chain of Memories was basically a way of saying, you can expect more of Riku as well as Ansem in the future games, and they will both be more than just some side characters. When all is said and done, Malusha is defeated, we enter the final moment of the game, and one thing is very clear. Namine is just an innocent girl who was taken advantage of. Despite the fact she is the cause of all these events and Sora went through all that hardship because of her powers, I can't bring myself to say she was the villain or the antagonist at any point in the story. This is a girl with no one around her, no friends, no family to share memories with, so for the first time an opportunity came where she was able to feel like she had some friends. The memories that she put inside Sora felt just as real to her if not even more. So at the end when it's revealed Sora can gain his memories back, it also means he would forget everything that happened at the castle. That of course means everything about Namine as well. Sora then makes the choice to make him the way he was before. Despite not remembering anything, he is fully aware that he has much more memories to regain, the memories that created the Sora we know. But in the case of Namine, she doesn't have any other memories to go back to. So when Sora makes the choice, you can see sadness, yet understanding. Her pure, innocent character understands why Sora did it, yet she realizes that this short life she had of these memories of her and Sora just can't be accepted. The reality of things is that at this very moment there is no happy ending for Namine. And honestly, this is actually an emotional scene executed to a good standard. On one hand, we're happy because we finally know Sora will remember everyone, all those characters we loved in Kingdom Hearts 1 are about to return. But on the other, this new girl we just met who wanted nothing more but to stop feeling lonely is now being left behind, having to Except Sora made the choice to remember the real memories rather than the ones she created with it. This is why when Chain of Memories is over and I put the game down, this is the character that stays in my mind. For me, Chain of Memories will always be Namine's game. Now, I did just say when I put the game down, but listen here, if you thought Kingdom Hearts 1 Platinum was tedious at times, then you are not ready for Chain of Memories because boy oh boy can this get boring. In order to get 100% on this game, there are some trophies that you can have a good, even if challenging time getting, such as the Winnie the Pooh mini games or beating the game on Proud. But there is a solid few trophies which take hours after completing the main story. The main ones to occupy you are reaching level 99 with both Sora and Riku, which in my opinion, in the first games wasn't too bad, but due to the fact battles are no longer in the open world, it actually slows things down quite a bit. I ended up watching some guys on the fastest ways to level up, which surely did help, but it doesn't change the fact that I am still leveling up. Currently, I've got Sora on level 76 and Riku on level 69. Nice. Another great trophy to be on the lookout for is Record Keeper Sora, which is essentially completing Jiminy's journal. This isn't too bad until you realise you have to collect every single fucking card in the game. That means every single chest needs to be explored, including the room to reward ones, which can only be accessed one at a time, every single enemy must be defeated, and their enemy card must be collected. It is just a lot of tedious, try again, and again, and again type of work. But apart from that, it's honestly a lot of fun. Yes, Kingdom Hearts 1 was pretty much the same. It required many hours, but it's just not as fun to do in Chain of Memories. Just the fact that you have to enter a battle and also the best XP is in Castle Oblivion rather than any of the other worlds kind of means you're doing the same thing for about realistically six, seven hours. And this is especially the case when leveling up Riku because his gameplay is nowhere near as flashy as Sora and it takes a little bit longer sometimes, so... Yeah, honestly, I will get it. I am still being an idiot set on getting this platinum. I've told myself to do it many times in the past, and it's about time I actually get it done. Chain of Memories is not a game I can say is either good or bad, amazing or horrible. Whilst it is definitely a harder game to get into than many others in the series, do not let opinions online determine if you play or skip this game. The main story this game has to offer is amazing. It's full of character development, introductions to new allies, enemies and reveals which are built up over a set amount of hours. It is 100% worth but also necessary to experience the main story it has to offer. However, the issues are very clear. The pacing of the story just isn't good, due to it being separated by revisits of this new world from the first game, and unlike the first game, this time these worlds have actually close to nothing to offer the player in terms of story or character development. They are clearly just fillers, and 
it sucks. Even if the game tries its best to make it fit into the theme of memories and how much of a key they really are, it is obvious they don't actually need to be the 90% of the time. It also doesn't help the combat, which you will mostly use within these Disney worlds, is far from everyone's favourite. Many players have bad memories of not enjoying it, whilst another huge chunk never even made it past the first world or two as it came off unappealing and just unenjoyable. The card system was just simply too much of a difference from the combat that we grew to love in the first game. That's not to say everyone feels this way because some players, like myself included, find genuine enjoyment in how different it is and everything it requires you to do. However, even then there is no denying this system has a lot of issues. The special moves you unlock as you play can easily be taken advantage of, making the playthrough far too easy during some boss fights and it loses some of that initial challenge which gave this game a reputation in the first place. Chain of Memories is a game that will really depend on what sort of a player you are and what you are willing to put up with. But that doesn't change the fact its story is one of the best in the whole franchise and it is even better after experiencing future games in Kinemas 2 as well as 358 over two days. If you revisit Chain of Memories after those two games, a lot of these moments of foreshadowing just hit so much more. Even if it means just re-watching the cutscenes online instead of playing, I highly recommend revisiting Chain of Memories to appreciate just how much was constantly foreshadowed and hinted that you never really considered until you have that further knowledge. If I could suggest one thing from this video, then I would say this. If you are someone who tried the game in the past and gave up on it because of its combat, maybe give it one more go because it really does get better and flashier and more fancy than just simply hoping your attack card is higher than some low level heartless. And if you still decide it's not for you, honestly, I can't blame you. I understand it's just not for everyone and that's okay because for me, I will always hold chain of memories high even though I'm aware of everything wrong with it. Hey, uh, thanks for watching. I know most of you have probably clicked off the video by this point, but if you are still here, then just know I am super, super thankful uh, for you watching this video and listening to what I have to say. You might have realized I sound way more casual now because I've been talking for two hours, okay? I'm trying to relax. Comment below how much of this video you agree or disagree with. I always think it's fine to disagree. It's not like any of my opinions should matter more than yours. I mean, a conversation in the comments is always interesting, but if you did find this video useful, entertaining, or you just want to support the channel, then a like and a comment would honestly help out so much more than you imagine, especially since Chain of Memories isn't exactly as popular as Kingdom Hearts 1, so I doubt this video will do anywhere near as good as the Kingdom Hearts critique, which still blows my mind how well that video did. I mentioned in a different video how there will be a gap before the Kingdom Hearts 2 critique, and that's mostly because I don't want to burn out for Kingdom Hearts, as well as I can already tell you that video will most probably be the longest video I have ever made, so the last thing I want to do is rush it. I feel like if I give it more time in the oven, it will be the best video I can make, rather than just feeling like this pressure on me to get it out within the next two months. So uh, you can definitely not expect the Kingdom Hearts 2 critique within the next five months. Unlike Chain of Memories, Kingdom Hearts 2 has a crap ton of things to do post main story and I want to enjoy my time with it rather than the pressure of getting it done ASAP, which I'm hoping you guys understand. Some videos you can expect in the meantime before then is a possible Bioshock video. I'm still debating if I want to make a critique or a worth playing video. Again, I do have a job outside of this, which just takes up a lot of time and I'm, I'm rambling now, so I'm just going to stop. Honestly, the plan is to make sure this year is huge for the channel so hopefully you guys will be interested in some of the content i have planned anyways i'm gonna get out uh get some sleep because i've been talking to this mic for far too long it has been over two hours thank you as always for checking out the video it honestly means everything and i will see you guys in the next one whatever video might be i'm out thank you bye